Hello ladies and gentlemen, welcome to this video here where we're going to talk about uh, the this project here by my uh, good friend uh, Stephen Chilton Architects here. Uh, you can check out his website. I'll put the link in the description and he was kind enough to share with me the model of uh, his pavilion that became um, second place for the for the Expo 2020. Um, I think it was in the Middle East somewhere. So thanks a lot, Stephen, for that. And to be honest, I've had this model for quite some time and uh, really struggled with it because of, um, well, as you will see, the lighting here is uh, completely, well, self-illuminated. So thanks to all the recent developments in Unreal, uh, I'm going to take you through this uh, project. I think I'm going to do this in several parts because there's a lot to talk about. And uh, bear in mind that this is all still work in progress, uh, very much so. We have, I'd also like to give a shout out to Michael, who's been helping me as well. I'll put his channel in the description because he's been helping me with um, the procedural side of this, which I'm going to talk about. So again, maybe if it goes a bit, a bit too long, I'll do it in three parts to go into detail of uh, specifically how we imported it uh, and how we recreated these elements because 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 the reason why we kind of started to talk about this project with Steve was that um, if you see for yourself on the site, um, all these little elements in his concept are animated. So, uh, well, you'll you'll see it on on his here. Well, uh, we won't spend the whole video looking at his, but. These things were animated, I believe, in 3ds Max, and from what I uh, hear, heard from Steve, it was quite a challenge, and obviously uh, quite a challenge to, to render and so on. So that's why we like to go um, and work in Unreal Engine, so that all of this stuff can be um, can be in real time, and we can even start to uh, to play, to design, and so on. So that's why uh, we've tried to, to set it up this way. So let me go into a little bit more. Um, I'll just show you a few kind of uh, views of it. Um, so the import, um, this is all done in a Rhino, and uh, I've got a I'm teaching quite a few students at the moment, and for for them it might be useful uh, to know about um, a couple of things. So actually, let me start Rhino again because uh, it takes quite some time to. So I've just reinstalled. Uh, Data Smith. So it takes quite some time to open this file. Uh, I'm probably going to have to cut the length of this. So this, as you can see, it's quite tedious already to have to navigate large files like this. And um, that's the idea: is that when you import this, uh, so it's coming to life. But when you import this in Rhino in uh, Unreal. I really recommend to uh, use levels like this. So for those of you who are familiar with Unreal, it won't be a secret. But uh, a lot of the time when I work with architects, uh, I get the entire file at once. You know, as an FBX or as a, as a data smith, that becomes a bit of a problem because we need to import. And also, to be honest, this is always the mistake that I make when I get a new file. I uh, I just import it all in one go, and uh, and it gives us a couple of 
problems. One, which is the sheer size of the file. Um, it, like you see for to open in Rhino, it takes forever in itself. Or if it's 3ds Max, if you've got a two gig file, again, it's a bit of a, well, it's a nightmare. Sometimes it can take a morning to open the file. Whereas here with the levels, when we go to the levels here, and um, we, so I'll, I'll maybe do a detailed tutorial how specifically to use the levels, but here in this instance, um, I'll just show you that I've separated all the different elements pretty much in the way that Steve had done it in his file. Here we go. And I had uh, installed Datasmith as well here. So I'll say a word about that in just a sec. So just to see here, the main kind of layer structure, I mainly uh, import, exported one Datasmith file using this export 3D view. It allows you to hide everything, only export what you see without having to save uh, export selected. Otherwise, you'll export the entire scene. So that's a bit of an issue. And then we uh, find the same structure in here. And that means that this main level that when I press save, well, you saw it was very, very quick to save. So that means we don't have to, um, well, it works a bit for like an XREFs for those of you who are familiar with that. Um, so that's a big uh, thing that, again, I made this, the mistake, first of all, I imported the whole thing at once. I didn't pay attention to the size of the file, and that gives us a bit of an issue. Another issue, and again, those of you who may be familiar with Unreal might have, <laughs> be, have your heart sink already by now, is here the number of actors. So that's, uh, uh, I've already halved it. Um, but that becomes a bit of an issue with um, with the size, um, with the number of actors and how responsive our scene's going to be. Talking of which, though, um, here I, um, I have a very, very good performance. And um, it's a little bit sort of uh, jagged edges here. So I'm actually going to go to screen percentage here and even increase that to 200%. And hold my breath that my computer doesn't explode and still I'm getting this frame rate so I'll go full screen and uh, here I'm, I'm not on 4k but I have just tried it before at 4k and you'll see that the performance is um, well just like this at the moment it's doing great it's really really amazing so um, so just going back to, to this idea of number of actors here, one thing that I did do is um, optimize this facade here. So you will see that, and this is again one of the issues with Rhino, is that when I did the export using Datasmith, and I don't know, maybe there's a way to prepare this before the export, but I'm not familiar enough with Rhino to, to do that right now. The um, when I did the export with Datasmith, each one of these rods came in individually, like this one, like these ones, which I haven't sort of merged into one thing. So again, uh, I'm not want to do a sort of a detailed tutorial on how to do that, but I did select all of these uh, just simply here in the outliner. And I used the Merge Actors tool. So it's really simple. Uh, all the um, sort of tubular uh, elements will be listed here. And I just pressed Merge with one caveat here, pivot point at zero. I had that ticked so that this thing would remain exactly in the same spot. Uh, and, and that allowed me to basically um, remove about 7,000 actors, I think it was. So I could carry on and do the same. Obviously, if you have to, if you make any modifications to this, you might have to re-import. Uh, okay, so that's that for the uh, the things. So yeah, just, just to kind of, while this is open now, 
I um, so I went one by one and I didn't I tried this uh, auto sync uh, button up here which is um, this is the sort of new Datasmith toolbar new or new to me <laughs> and uh, um, I spent a few hours exporting things and then lost everything so I I didn't use this anymore and just use the traditional sort of using export to Datasmith file. And then once that is open, sorry to rant on for those of you who know all this already, um, I had my sort of Datasmith files that come into here. You can see my, my newly sort of merged mesh here. And then I just simply created a level and <clears throat> added each one of these Datasmith exports into the level. So this works really well when you don't have any materials here um, exported uh, or having to manage many, many materials. When, when we have many more materials, it's a uh, little bit other issues um, are at stake. So that's that for basically the two sort of things about exporting one using Datasmith as layers and um, my computer's frozen now. It's doing something funny. Hang on. Yeah, I think sequencer was um, playing up in the background. Um, so yes, two, two things exporting with Datasmith uh, and, and separating it out. And as in my trainings I always talk about, big, medium, and small, try to make some sense uh, to, to, uh, uh, and to allow changes to happen so that we don't have to re-import everything. I know it's difficult with Revit to do that, but um, as much as we can, and also sort of minimizing this number of actors here, which can become a bit of an issue. So I'm um, getting on a bit. So I thought I'd just sort of show you a little bit more of a um, of the building and talk a little bit more about these umbrellas. And we'll do kind of a much, much more detailed under the hood uh, review of what's going on here. And actually, uh, Michael and I are going to prepare a workshop um, f with this sort of um, technology and skills and uh, approach in mind parametric modeling so i'll put a link below if you're uh, if you're interested to um, to um, show your interest for the workshop then um, please uh, sign up uh, below uh, just put in your email so the issue here well what we wanted to try really is to be able to place these points and um, procedurally um, in Unreal assign them via blueprints. So that's exactly what we did uh, here. And here I must uh, say a big thank you to to Martin from I'll go and I'll plug his website from uh, uh, White uh, Architect in uh, Scandinavia. Uh, who are who really introduced me to this idea of um, of exporting from Rhino and exporting points, and that's really really interesting because uh, we can use that a lot more. And this is sort of effectively how um, you know on the basis of of Houdini and things like that. So going back to Rhino, I prepared that little file here, which is um, what I was working with. As of late, again, this is very much in progress. That's his one. And here we go. So just the principle of it, again, I'm not going to go too much in the uh, in the detail. I'll do that another time. But the, uh, the idea here is that we place the points uh, along uh, whatever geometry we need to, and we export these. Um, as a data table. Um, so here, I'll just need to enable a few of those. And here we go. So this is now, there we go. So this, here, I just uh, randomly placed these things around a torus. And then we're able to open um, all the points. So here, I've got however many. Um, uh, 2000, I think, and all of these are then exported 
to a um, to a, uh, an Excel spreadsheet or a CSV file and then re-imported um, in Unreal Engine. Oh, if I can open that. Um, using a data table. table. So I'll, I'll, I'm going on too long, so I'll do another video exactly to uh, show how we do that. Um, and then on top of that, we have got the um, material that is animated. So that's kind of independent of the points. It's a sort of a, a, a another thing on top. But uh, this would allow us amazing amount of flexibility. And again, this is a still work in progress. We're going to work on the animation here to match much close, much more closely the one that was designed um, by Steve here. Uh, and and so on and uh, but here I was became quite fascinated <laughs> with with the sort of change of color I'm not exactly sure that's what uh, Steve had in mind but um, you know for for YouTube thumbnail <laughs> I thought we'd do something that is going to attract attention a little bit so um, so here we go. So I hope that was sort of somewhat useful. Again, I'm going to, uh, to, to do a little bit of a series. So if you've got uh, questions or things you would like me to cover in this um, in this file, do let me know. Just a, a note about the lighting here um, that I'll go full screen for that. Um, there are no lights in this scene. So this is very, very um, encouraging. And again, so you can see this frame right here, which is pretty incredible full screen. So I'll just um, show you what's going on on these little um, umbrellas here. Normally I'm going to work on 4K. This feels very clumsy here, the the interface um, at 20... Um, 1080p but so here if I replace this material just drag and drop it here and uh, let it refresh you see that there is no lights at all this is all illuminated by these um, self illuminated materials in fact I had to get rid of a little detail which is missing let me bring it back there we go, that uh, those little LED strips, I'm going to reassign that material because it was flickering a little bit. So I'll bring that back. Oh, here we go. So that just adds a nice little detail of uh, oh, self-illumination here underneath these canopies. Really, as always, Steve, amazing designer. Um, so this is this is pretty incredible. This is, I think, why I was just not really able to um, to to do this earlier because of uh, there's just the sheer number of lights. How would we? How would we on earth would we do this? Even on the inside here. If I sorry, if I just go back in, um, you've got to sit and stare at it for a little while to kind of just observe how the lighting changes hopefully sorry if i'm going on too long for those of you who are still left uh, thank you for watching that long so here we go now it's sort of the lighting on the inside is uh, being affected by these millions of little flowers and i don't know if that was steve's idea to kind of to me when it sort of turns a little bit green uh, there's this feel here we go so the flowers now turning green and the inside it takes a little while to catch up maybe if I shake it a little bit so here we go so now it goes sort of bluish greenish hopefully and then turns into um, Oh, so it's, it always changes a little bit, never does exactly what you want it but here we go it gives us a little bit of a garden eye feeling maybe a Reminds us that spring is coming and <laughs> it's not going to be cold and gray winter forever. All right, so it's great to be back and I haven't posted for a while. So hopefully there's going to be a lot more coming from me in the um, in the near future. And um, I hope this was uh, useful and I'll see you next time.